OK. So welcome, everybody, to this uh, th third uh, chat of the course. Uh, we are uh, approaching the, th the third week, basically. And um, this, week, uh, this week's topics were about, uh, as you saw from the lectures and from the lab, uh, about uh, the creation of uh, web pages with HTML and CSS. Um, uh, we, we try to condense the, uh, the most important things in, in this week uh, so that you can, we, we will uh, uh, next uh, try to add uh, the JavaScript programming onto these web pages, but at least we, we should have some basic skills that should be comfortable with uh, in creating these web pages. Uh, so uh, again, um, I just want to spend a couple of minutes of introduction just by uh, recalling the the message that they sent to everybody uh, yesterday on Slack because I felt I had several questions and uh, I felt that uh, uh, there is there could be some misunderstanding or uh, or maybe we still need to, you know, to, to, to understand each other about, uh, or to find a better way of organizing the lectures, okay? Uh, so several people told us that they, they, could, they didn't understand very well the timing with which we are um, organizing the lectures and organizing the, the weeks of work. Uh, so basically what we are trying to do, uh, just by summarizing the message that you have on Slack, uh, um, is to try to, uh, provide you three hours of classes hmm, in video format uh, every week, more or less three hours, maybe some be shorter, something longer. So it's not very, um, we are not very restricted to the uh, 3.00 uh, minutes because uh, uh, of the flexibility of the format. So we try to squeeze or enlarge depending on the on the topic that we are trying to deal with. But more or less uh, the, the, the overall goal is to maintain the three hours a week uh, that would be corresponding to the three hours that we have uh, in the uh, in the Thursday morning schedule. Uh, I decided for flexibility uh, not to have the three hours live every Thursday morning because three hours live would be really heavy for everybody and uh, it will force you to, you know, to, to be synchronous uh, with me. And uh, I, we, we felt and we also decided together on the first uh, meeting that uh, having asynchronous videos would be better. So, um, and uh, the other part, the important part of the course is the lab on Friday morning, which will take 1.5 hours. Okay, so if you imagine that the course would be a normal course in the classroom, you would have three hours of lectures and 1.5 hours of labs, and uh, you will work on the lab on the Friday morning. Okay, the fact that we are publishing the videos before the day of Thursday and publishing the lab before the day of Friday is for your flexibility. Okay, uh, we don't expect uh, you to um, study everything. Uh, or solve the exercise uh, completely before the lab. There is the lab time for doing that. But if you want to have a look before uh, uh, the lab, so that on Friday morning you have uh, you will have more, let's say, um, deeper questions or uh, having some question about uh, what what you already started to do, you're free to do that. Okay. So um, what? Uh, uh, Somebody probably uh, thought that uh, we are putting too much extra effort on you, uh, but actually we are trying to, to to remap everything in the same amount of work uh, that we would have done with, with a normal course. Only we are uh, we are making a, a, a big effort. Uh, you should uh, believe me in, in trying to publish material at the beginning of the week, even if uh, formally you are from the official timetable you're supposed to be working towards the end of the week so you can you're free to, to wait until uh, uh, Thursday and Friday before looking at the videos or or working on the lab but if you want you can uh, we, you we can you can be flexible and look at it in, an, in any other moment so I think uh, uh, it should clarify some 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 issues that uh, arose during them some some of the messages um, and also I will really try to 
uh, ask you uh, whenever there are any misunderstandings uh, or problems uh, or issues uh, to we have the slack channel try to use that okay so uh, there's not, nothing wrong with asking a question with giving a suggestion also about the organization of the course uh, so it's better since we don't have the, the opportunity of seeing each other in the face uh, so some kind of uh, implicit communication is missing uh, uh, we should all make an effort uh, of making this kind of communication more explicit from everybody's side. Okay, so that's we are I'm really asking you to also to share your feelings uh, or your issues on, on the Slack channel so that we can discuss them. Okay, I want to close it because I don't want to take the floor for for the whole uh, time, and uh, I would let uh, you uh, to give some comments uh, or ask some questions uh, or whatever you feel like sharing with us in this chat moment. We are not uh, much people, we are 20 people, but uh, it, it's it's okay. So it's not, a, this weekly video chat is not a, an extra lecture, okay? It's a, an opportunity to discuss, to have some clarifications maybe, to ask us some questions or to propose some, some ideas. And uh, it will not, uh, my promise is that in during the video chat we will not uh, deliver any extra material any extra topics so it's not one hour extra but it's the kind of time that we would usually spend in the during the lecture intervals or after the classes or you just jump into my office and ask a couple of questions we don't have this opportunity and then try to organize that this is moment weekly so you you may attend in real time you may uh, see the chat later on or if you if you miss it or if you skip it uh, is not a, a big problem because as, uh, as i said there will be nothing new i'm not explaining anything new here um okay so i saw a, a first uh, question uh, from asus uh, that asked me to um, explain the part of timeout to delete the task after its deadline in the to-do manager program. So um, we can maybe have a look at the solution that we posted. Uh, so the uh, we, uh, we will publish it uh, yesterday. So uh, maybe we can, we can refer to that solution. Let me just uh, share the browser. And uh, so share screen number this one. Okay, and you see that we have a lab number one here. Let me pull again the, the chat window because it always disappears in the participant window. Okay, um, now we have the, um, the solution published here like the third point is possible is this one uh, let me increase the size a bit so uh, actually the idea is uh, delete the task after its, its deadline let's uh, have a look at the description first so that we remember we all remember what it was asking Yeah. One, two, three. Okay. Automatically delete a task when it expires. So you. Uh, so this means that when you insert a new task, uh, you should uh, immediately schedule a timer for deleting the task when the time comes. Okay, so uh, all the tasks that are inserted, are, they are inserted synchronously. So when the user asks to insert a task, it will be added. But then at the same time, uh, at the same time we are scheduling a new timer uh, whose length 
is equal to the time difference between now and the task expiration uh, time, okay? Um, so this is the first part. When I insert a new task, I need uh, to, to schedule a timer uh, set to the expiration time of the, of the, of the task. So if I'm, uh, uh, for example, right now at 10 to, uh, 10 17, and I have a task that will uh, expire uh, this afternoon at four, for example, uh, I will compute the difference between now and uh, today at four. It will be, what's that? Uh, from 11 to 16 is uh, five hours, five hours plus 43 minutes. Uh, so they, this number of milliseconds is the uh, duration of the timeout we are setting first. Second, what do we do when the timeout expires? Well, when the timeout expires, the callback function will be called just to delete that element from, from, the, um, from the, uh, the list. And we see that in the solution. It's one possible solution, of course. You may have also have found uh, different approaches. But uh, uh, there's this, uh, what is that? So when I insert a task, uh, what is that? Add task. Okay, we are, I'm, I have the code for adding a task. It's nothing special. You are asking all the uh, nitty gritty questions about all the properties and then creating the task object here. Okay, with these uh, uh, properties, description, urgent, private, and deadline. Uh, and we add this task at the end of the array. Okay, so this is the, the, this, the synchronous part. And then we check um, the deadline, the deadline field here. Is this uh, a, a correct number? So what's the deadline? Uh, this is uh, just a check. We're saying, okay, we're trying to deadline is the date object. Dot get time returns you the number of milliseconds uh, since January 1st, 1970, corresponding to this date. And uh, it's possible that this uh, get time, this deadline is not uh, a correct date, so this conversion to millisecond will fail. So in th that case, the, re the result will, will be not a number. So in this case, the deadline. Uh, is is uh, is wrongly written. So we are not uh, really checking the inputs here. So, so mm, we are accepting everything that the user writes. Uh, it's not good practice, probably. We need to do some validation, but for the moment, uh, it's just as simple as it gets. Uh, so we are checking just whether the deadline is really a date that can be, can be converted to milliseconds. Yes, if yes, then we, we, are, we are scheduling the self-destruction self timer, okay, like in the movies. Uh, we check the time for now, and uh, we compute uh, the difference between now, milliseconds, and deadline milliseconds. So this is the amount of time we need to wait. To wait. Hmm? This is the amount of time we need to wait before destroying the task. Um, and I'm scheduling this uh, function to be executed at that time. So the first thing I do is the computation of how, how long should the timer wait. And then I define a function that will delete actually a given task from the list of tasks. This function is a splice, okay? The splice method is usually you know, to, to cut some part of the array out of the array itself to delete some elements. Uh, the, the interesting part is uh, uh, where are these variables coming from? Tasks, the plural of tasks is coming from here. It's a closure over this variable, which is, by, by the way, this parameter. So uh, add task is a method which is called here in the menu. Add task is here. Uh, by passing this task parameter, which is an array defined in the, in the, in the main module. 
okay so we are declaring the variable here we are passing it uh, to the add task function as a parameter we are um, this parameter is used and uh, uh, this inner function closes uh, i guess a closure of that so the function remembers uh, uh, the um, remember the uh, the variable containing the list of tasks and also remembers the task object hmm? task is this object here that we just created so it remembers exactly which kind of object I just added. So when it's time to, to delete that, uh, it will just uh, uh, know which object it needs to delete. And so when, when the timer rings, this function is called and this function already knows where is the array and which is the object to be deleted. And it will delete one object starting from the position of this task. Uh, we decided to uh, remember the task object instead of the task position hmm? because in the uh, between now and the time the timeout will expire it's possible that we are adding maybe some tasks in the middle we are reordering the array we are deleting something in the middle and so the position of the task will change probably hmm? um, Probably this last parameter is not needed because it should be a parameter that it will be passed to this function, but this function gets no parameters at all. So this last parameter is uh, it not needed if I'm not wrong here. So I hope this mechanism is uh, is more clear now. Uh, of course, these are very. What happens with JavaScript is, uh, is that may, in many cases complex solutions are just compacted in a very few lines because it's a very compact code, especially when you're doing uh, uh, callbacks. Just remember that this line number 27 is not executed, is not executed when we call the add task function, but it will be executed later when this amount of time will pass. So this ex uh, deletion will take place later. If the object is still there, of course, if by chance this object is, will not be in the list of tasks anymore uh, then uh, this index of will not find it and so we are not going to to delete that um uh, i i'll answer this first to jacopo because it's related to what we are saying uh, is whether it's okay to declare the task array as a kind of global variable out of any function or the closure approach is better so uh global is bad uh, always um right now we are just in a single program so we have the control over every variable that we see but uh, uh, imagine that when we move into the browser uh, in the browser we have many scripts uh, many javascript uh, codes that are running at the same time uh, some is the code I write to do the auto completion some is the code I write uh, uh, to sort the, the list of tasks and so on so imagine if every piece of code would uh, uh, store their data into a global variable and in this case uh, in the browser the global variable will be attribute of the window object in javascript as we'll see in, uh, next week um, the the probability of clashing the names or having two snippets of code to use the same name uh, is very very high so uh, let's not do that let's try to uh, create uh, applications that are self-contained every application contains their own data uh, right now we are say hiding or storing the data uh, here at the module level uh, we will learn uh, to create modules that will uh, you know isolate some variables that so that it will be let's say is not the correct terminology but there will be variables global to a module but invisible to other modules uh, this is uh, something that we can accomplish with the uh, immediately invoked uh, functional expression that we saw last time, which is a syntax trick uh, for getting these results, uh, uh, declaring some variables that will not be accessible from outside. So the, we will do any effort not to use the global variables uh, as much as possible. Um, okay. Um, I, 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 I'll take the, the question from Claudiana. 
uh, which, which probably is one of the questions that you're not able to answer. <laughs> um, due to an emergency situation, there is the possibility that we won't go back to the university. Uh, in this case, have you thought about the exam modality and the possible changes? Uh, thought, yes. Uh, decided no. Um, we we, st we are of course starting to think, and everybody starting to think about uh, what will happen with the exam session in June. Uh, in the case uh, which I would call it likely, in the likely case uh, that we won't be able to do the exams at the Polytechnic. So for the courses that have an oral exam, it's not a problem. The big problem is for the courses who have a, um, a written exam. So it's very difficult to ensure that the written exam is valid so that everybody is doing their own work as they're not copying uh, by sharing with their smartphone, uh, with their friends uh, or so. The, so the director and the vice rector, Professor Forti, are studying solutions uh, that could ensure the execution of the exams uh, also from a legal point of view in this, uh, uh, in this kind of context. Uh, so we are, the, the, so the the rector and the vice rector are studying this problem, so we are also waiting for what kind of uh, guidelines they will give us. In our case, in this case, uh, um, the exam is a laboratory exam, so it's it's different. It's not written on a piece of paper, but you have to de develop something. So it may be probably easier in some sense. Uh, so that uh, what you will do in in Labinf where uh, you code your solution and then push it to GitHub, you can do it yourself uh, at home. Mm -hmm. The only uh, difference is that uh, in the lab, uh, we are able to check that you are not cheating, you're not communicating, and if you are working at home, we cannot check that uh, in any way. Uh, and so we will probably need to have some quick oral question or something like that, just to ensure that what you submitted is actually your work. So we need to, to find some, some mix that will enable you to work and develop uh, quietly in your home. But at the same time, we should be uh, certifying, you should have a means of certifying that you uh, did your work uh, yourself. And this is the only way, the only way it comes to my mind right now, but I said nothing is decided yet. We're just sharing our thoughts. Um, what we are thinking now is maybe to, to have a, a very short question about your code, and uh, it's very easy for us to understand uh, whether you're familiar with, the, with your solution or not, uh, and, uh, uh, um, and so we can understand whether it's uh, your work or you try to copy that. We'll try to, uh, to understand uh, more precisely what we can do and what we will do. Uh, if the there are two ifs here. If in June we will not be at Politecnico, and if the the uh, summer session will still be in June, because you know there is also another possibility. We shift all the set of the exams from June to September. Technically, it's a possibility. So the summer session of exams uh, will be shifted in at the later time. So we will have maybe I don't know two two months of exams in September. I I don't know yet what they will decide. It all depends on the time in which the, all these constraints will be relaxed uh, um, some of the time. Uh, so we'll try to share the news that we have. Um, okay, uh, there's a question by Mostafa, uh, who is asking, uh, uh, for inserting urgent and private tasks, there should be a default one, but I can find out to address this part. Let's see here. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, trim, yes. This is a, um, yes, in this case, there's not a, um, a real uh, default because uh, actually what it's saying here is, for example, urgent, is a boolean that is true if the answer to this question is yes okay 
uh, and only if the answer to this question is yes. In all the other cases, so if you are di uh, if you're writing no, or if you're just uh, entering, uh, pushing the enter key without writing anything, the this response uh, will be, for example, the empty string, and this the empty string is not equal to y. So I would say urgent is true if the user uh, typed exactly a Y letter in lower or upper case. If he typed anything else, or if he didn't type anything at all, just pressed enter, this equal will be false. And so by default, urgent will be false. So this is a way of getting, this is the only case where it will be true in all the other cases including the case in which the user didn't write anything, then this will be false. That will set the default value. If I don't write anything, this condition is not valid. And therefore, if I don't write anything, this becomes false. If I wanted uh, the, the, the opposite, so if I wanted the default to be true, I would have compared with no. And so no, we'd have uh, given a false value. So we, I, I would have made a not instruction here, not uh, um, question equal to no. Um, and, uh, and in that case, uh, it will reverse the, the, the understanding of the, of the, of the uh, let's say, of the question. Uh, so the default value for urgent should be no. And the default uh, value for private should be no. Ah, okay. So what you're saying is that this is, this default is wrong. Hmm? Yes, probably you're you are right, probably. Hmm. For given this discussion, the default for private in this case, in this code is uh, uh, false. And that would make it a public task. Hmm. So uh, in this case, there's a... Um, a wrong, uh, uh, um, uh, we will correct this because actually it will take the, the opposite default. Why for urgent, it, it should be uh, the correct one. Thanks for noticing. Uh, Alessio is asking whether for yes or no question, it's better to use question or the keys in uh, yes or no strict. Um, they are different uh, questions. Uh, a question uh, waits for a string to be entered, uh, while the key yes or no will just wait for one key to be pressed, uh, and uh, uh, it only accepts y uh, and n. It will not accept any other uh, any other value. So in the case you are really asking for yes or no, and you don't want to wait for the enter key, the key in yes or no is, uh, is maybe is better. Uh, in the other case, uh, uh, question is more general. But let me let me say one thing. Uh, uh, I I want to forget all this red line stuff uh, as soon as possible. Okay, uh, we will not use it uh, any any longer in the course basically, uh, because uh, from the next week we will get the data from the HTML page and not from the user console. Okay, so it's not worth to become experts in read line hmm? because uh, our applications will not run in the console, but they will run in the browser when we will get the information through the DOM. And so the, 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 um, the approach will be totally different, uh, totally asynchronous by the way. Hmm? So we, the, we just uh, wanted to create a first application that we can run without the browser to give you something sim simple. And unfortunately, this read line is more complex than, uh, than we thought, uh, and it raised a lot of questions. Uh, but uh, what we can assure you that, is that we will not see this library, this read line uh, in, the, in the future, because our code will run in the browser or in the web server. And in both cases, there is not a console, there is not a user typing. And that's also maybe why uh, it's so difficult uh, to to interact with the user on the console in JavaScript because JavaScript was not uh, the JavaScript libraries were not thought were not designed for this kind of text interaction basically. Okay.
the Mustafa is again a fan of uh, data validation and is telling that the description uh, in this code it may be left empty uh, and while maybe it should be a mandatory field uh, yes I mean uh, every time you you get some data from an input uh, you always have uh, uh, to be perfect you should have always have uh, more code in validation the input uh, for checking all the possible errors uh, is is it empty is it too short uh, does it contain only spaces uh, and so on uh, before accepting the, day, the the value, rather than maybe the complexity for processing it. So uh, having a comprehensive validation of the input uh, will be important, of course. Um, again, uh, when we uh, move to the HTML uh, interface, uh, we will check, uh, uh, we'll see that the, the forms, uh, we didn't uh, mention the, the, the form elements in, uh, in HTML yet, uh, uh, so we'll study them. We'll see that uh, we can have we take we can attach uh, some validation functions to each form. So for every field of the form, you can have your own function that will decide whether that value is acceptable or not. Again, here we wanted to do something, uh, let's say, quicker, and so we didn't uh, care too much about uh, error um, error checking. Also, in the text of the lab, you see that there is no mention of error checking. So in the, in the spirit of a real application, yes, you should check everything. In the spirit of a quick lab exercise that is uh, assumed to be, uh, to take only one hour and a half to solve, uh, we are cutting corners. We are just simplifying something and say, okay, let's focus uh, on, the, on the list of objects uh, and not focus too much uh, on, the, on the input. Hmm? Uh, the default value for the deadline, uh so the issue was that okay in, uh, if you want a real uh, answer uh it would be don't use uh don't use date as an object because the parsing of the new dates uh, is uh, ambiguous so uh, it's always uh, difficult to um, to be sure whether what you are typing can be interpreted at, as a date uh, correctly. So if the user is forced to, uh, okay, if you are sure that the user will write the date in this format that you're suggesting, then it's fine. Hmm? Uh, it will be uh, interpreted correctly. Uh, the problem is that uh, you are not sure and so if the user will write something different, uh, maybe month uh, slash day slash year, instead of using slashes instead of dashes and uh, uh, changing the order of the fields, uh, well, they, that may be a match with the, um, with the current uh, uh, locale of the dates. So maybe the Italian format of the dates. And the data will parse also that. Hmm? So uh, something that could be, should be an invalid date according to the syntax uh, will be considered as valid. But, uh, but interpreting a lo um, say, uh, an interpretation that may be in the United States is different from Europe. Hmm? And so will give you, uh, let's say, unpredictable results. Hmm? Uh, this is uh, implicit in the date parse uh, methods and the parsing algorithms of data that try to to build an object uh, in, all, in all the possible cases. Uh, so what you could do if you really want to validate uh, these dates is first of all, uh, while this value is still a string, you could check whether this string corresponded to this format. So you could, for example, check whether the the, the answer, so read line dot question returns you a string object, and you should, you should check whether this string is actually eight characters long with the first four are digits, uh, and then a dash, and then two digits, and then a dash, and then two digits. You can do that for a, with a regular expression, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, you write a regular exception that will check the, uh, the, the string format before converting to date. So you're doing your own validation on the string. And then you create a date object only when you are sure that the string you are passing will be passed correctly. 
The alternative is not using the date uh, object, as I mentioned in the, in the last slides uh, of, this pre of the presentation, but using a library like Moments, uh, which is more uh, powerful from that point of view. And so it can, you can specify the format uh, in which you want uh, the parsing algorithm to work. The problem is that uh, we, uh, with the date object, we cannot force it only to understand this format and to reject everything else. So it at least us with the validating before instead of just relying on the correct creation of the of the object. Because the problem is that we will create an object uh, even when the, the date uh, is not what we expect. Um, and of course, uh, there are, uh, uh, I agree with Marco that say, if we have a browser application to get a date, uh, it's very unlikely that we'll ask uh, the user to write the date inside. Uh, inside of a text field, uh, we will use some sort of a calendar widget uh, or to get this information, of course. Just remember that in, uh, uh, in the HTML5 forms, uh, there is already a predefined type uh, of calendar that will pop up a small calendar in the browser uh, without, the need, uh, without the need of any, of any jQuery or other libraries uh, just that will help you to insert the data and validate them. So there's a lot of power already in the browsers that will uh, Avoid this problem. Avoid the user to write the date in a format which is, will be exactly passed. So yes, the browser environment is much is much richer, so it will uh, anticipate the, the the parsing of the uh, and the detection of the errors uh, while the user is, is entering the data. Uh, whenever possible, we should avoid uh, the possibility for the user to make errors. So a good program is a program where, they, uh, where it's impossible to make errors. So we should not give the user an opportunity to enter data which is not valid. We should try always to, uh, for example, in a web page, this urgent will be a checkbox, private will be a checkbox, and they will be initialized in the non set or in the set state uh, when, when we open the window. So you cannot enter anything else. And uh, the, deadline will be, the deadline will be a calendar widget and so on. Um, of course, we we will have to to implement this uh, in the in the in the next labs. Of course, when we go to the interactive part. Um, yes, I think that. Uh, okay. Yes. Other questions. Uh, so, if there are no questions at the moment, I would just uh, uh, want to clarify something about uh, uh, tomorrow's lab. Uh, I think it's very it should be clear from the uh, from the description that you are not uh, supposed to do anything interactive here. Okay. There's no uh, inserting. There's no deleting. There's no filtering. Of the uh, of the of the um, of the tasks here, okay. Um, there's no JavaScript. There's no model here. We are just imagining the in the kind of interface that we would like uh, these tasks to be presented in. Mm -hmm. So uh, you you just put some some fake data. Uh, what is that? Uh, insert a few dummy tasks and a few dummy projects. You just code them directly in the HTML to give it, to make an static example. Okay, don't try, right now, don't try to do anything dynamic uh, with, with JavaScript, okay? Uh, the, the issue here is to have a, a well-structured HTML page with all the contents and try to apply a bit of uh, uh, formatting uh, layout uh, with sidebars and so on to this HTML page. And just to make a page which is not just empty <laughs> or empty blocks, uh, we'll try to enter some information which corresponds to the, to the task. So we will get familiar with the uh, with layout, we'll get familiar with tables, uh, with the bootstrap, uh, which is suggested for creating the layout uh, instead of doing that by hand and so on. And, uh, and so let's just uh, 
then we will, uh, uh, of course, uh, learn how to insert a task and to say, like this here, it, it says here, these elements should be clickable. Okay. So it should be a, a checkbox and not uh, um, uh, just an image. But what happens when we click it uh, is not defined. Nothing happens if we click it. Okay. So that, uh, don't, don't think uh, uh, that uh, uh, you should uh, already implement the working page. Only a page that looks like the real thing. Only a mock-up, basically. Okay. So a single page, CSS files, uh, and no code, no JavaScript at the moment. That will be for later when we will try to mix the algorithm for managing the list and the um, and the um, and the front end in in HTML. Uh, most of you are asking whether they can send a pull request for the labs. Uh, not really pull request because we are not going to. Uh, so, if you find any errors in the solutions and you want to correct uh, our solutions, yes, you can send a pull request. You will evaluate and maybe accept that uh, in our, uh, let's say, repository. But if you want to show us uh, some uh, uh, some of your code. Uh, it's better that you can uh, that you just commit. Uh, so I, I assume that you are working not on the clone of this laboratory, but on a for, on a forked version. Hmm. So if you fork the lab in your uh, in your uh, workspace, uh, then you may uh, just commit to your workspace, uh, and then we. It, it, you can share with us the link saying, okay, I have this problem, and this is my project, and have a look at that. It's better that if you keep it separate uh, rather than the, than the, say, the, the official one. Because otherwise, we'll have a lot of pull requests. Some will be for merging, so suggestion for mergings, and others just have a look at this, and it will be very confusing to look at. So just fork, work in your space. You commit your solution, and you can ask a question. It's we prefer it to do uh, if you do that uh, on Slack initially, so that uh, uh, we are three teachers working on the course. So if you send an, an email to one of them, maybe in that moment uh, they may be busy to respond. If you write on Slack, we will all see. So the first one who is uh, say more familiar with the with the question will try to uh, reply. Then if the discussion becomes longer, we can switch to private messages on Slack. But uh, uh, we will also st always start from the uh, from the link that maybe you sent and the question that you sent, and they will also the, the answer may also benefit others. If it's not a true specific problem, it's better to have that in the in the discussion channel on Slack. So uh, by all means, if you have question about your code, they are more important than the question about my code. Okay, because that's actually it's something that you did and you found some problems. And instead of trying to copy the solution. I mentioned at the beginning that I'm sort of always uh, against or dubious about uh, the, the um, uh, publishing the solution so soon. No? So uh, we are, we are, you ask for them, we publish them, but um, it's better if you try to do them and if you, if you find some problems or maybe you find solutions that are totally different from ours, it's better that if, if we can discuss your solutions instead of you discussing our solution. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, it doesn't seem that there are uh, many questions uh, at the moment. So, ah, sorry, Ricardo. 
yeah yeah of course uh, if you uh, well uh, you may also speak it's not a problem you just uh, open the mic and open the microphone and you can speak and ask the question directly uh, we could also make a party and everybody opens their uh, their camera so that we can see each other in the in, in the face probably or while you're speaking so that uh, i'm only seeing a, a um, a black screen of names, uh, which is very sad uh, for me to, to be interacting with. But uh, we. Prof? Yeah. Um, I uh, would ask uh, to uh, clarify the, about the clearing floats you explained in the CSS yeah. part. Uh, yes, let me try to draw. A picture. Uh, let me be clarify so it's faster than code. Uh, is there a way to create a new page here? No, so I delete everything. Clear. Okay, so uh, the idea is that if I want to wait, it was so I want to create a page. Uh, in which may the, the classical structure okay is a heading okay there's not no problem and then may have i have a first block uh there may be a sidebar okay and then a main content like this okay and then i want to create a footer so uh what i do is that uh, to, to create this layout uh, i would uh, uh, set the property float left to the first sidebar and again the property float left to the main content okay why left and not right because i uh, i want the the main content to be touching in a way with a given margin to be touching the sidebar if i had to do a, a float right and so when i actually when i in, when i resize this browser so if i had to make the, the browser window larger or smaller uh, then there will be more or less space here so it will be uh, resized here but this space will be always the same so I, I need this main content to, to lean on the, on, the, on the sidebar. And uh, OK, what happens if I want to write some more text? If I want to write some more text, in the, maybe in the footer, uh, the, the positioning algorithm would say, OK, this is a floating element. This is a floating element. And so the, the 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 text for the footer may start here. So let me try to pick another color. We'll start here. And we'll wrap around. Uh, or maybe if the content is smaller, if the content were smaller, like that, like this, maybe. We'll finish here, then the footer will start here. Huh? Because you imagine it's like a like like a newspaper. Like a newspaper when you have oh sorry, when you have a, an article with a picture floating left, this is the picture and this is the text that will float around. So in the when we have floating elements, uh, uh, the the rest of the content which is not floating. Okay, we'll try to uh, fill the blank, fill the holes where uh, the floating elements are not uh, are not displayed. We want to avoid that, and we want to be sure that uh, the footer will only start uh, here, only in this area here. So we want to say, okay, here this point, we it's on, we'll only start. Uh, when the all the floats above it are finished so if the left if the left one is longer then we wait until the end of the left one if the right one is longer then we wait until the end of the, the right one 
we may leave some empty space here we may be, leave some empty space there it's our choice but we want the, the, the footer to start only when the um, the, the all the floats uh, have finished are finished so for example we write uh, clear left as a property so in this case uh, the footer the div containing the footer will clear all the so close finish all the left hanging floats before opening this div in this case there could be some uh, right hang in this case we don't have any right hanging floats if we had some right hanging floats they in this case they they would they would continue here and if we want to be sure that we clear everything we can use the clear both both means left and right so in this case we are clearing all the floats above we are waiting for them to be finished and then we start clear with the full width of the page without any hanging float that will uh, shorten our code oh okay, okay. yeah uh, this again this is the old style of working very low level right now if we are using a library the, it will do everything for us because uh, if, for example in bootstrap uh, this will be one row This will be one row, one. This will be another row. And this row will be divided into two columns. So when we close a row, we begin another row, we are uh, in Bootstrap automatically doing this stuff uh, that at the low level we should do by clearing uh, floats. Anyone else? Oh yes, this is a bug. Uh, I read the message from Mustafa that say that if I'm doing this, uh, actually um, the the part that is contained in these two floats uh, here, this part here at the, at the top, uh, will only have a floating content inside, and so uh, it will come up with a zero height. And uh, there's a risk that this uh, clear this division at the bottom will uh, just start uh, at the beginning because there's no uh, real uh, um, content in this part. Uh, yes, this is a it's not a bug; is the consequence of these definitions. Usually, you solve them uh, with a trick of different divs, uh, one inside of the other, so that one div can get the maximum height of the other one. Um, the, the complexity of these details uh, is the reason why the frameworks exist. So getting this right, uh, in all the cases, uh, by taking into account the resizing of the of the window, by taking into account uh, the possible fact that this the sidebar can be shorter or longer than the content, uh, it makes you a lot of special cases that you have to handle differently. So there's a lot of literature about them. So they, they wrote books uh, on how to do all these kind of layouts. Uh, and you can find examples around uh, if you just search the CSS, the two column layout, the CSS, three column layout, you find a lot of, uh, of resources there. And there are strange tricks, uh, basically, you know, like uh, putting uh, empty elements uh, or invisible paragraphs or something like that. Uh, uh, instead of uh, our approach, is instead of learning all these tricks, uh, which is actually quite old, uh, let's try to use some modern solutions. Uh, like uh, like some uh, we, we propose bootstrap but there are also other three or four major css frameworks that will be able to solve all the problems for us the trick is that these uh, um, problems that most of us uh, mentions uh, uh, are also different in different browsers 
So there are these corner cases are dealt differently by the browser. So if you want to really have a, a good solution, it's a lot of extra work, low level uh, work. Mm -hmm. We are more focused uh, on getting the logic of the application running. So we try to, again, find uh, easy solutions uh, where everything is already working, we use that. Uh, and even if, of course, we don't, uh, we want to understand the basic mechanism. But then we are, you know, like you are learning assembler because you want to understand how a computer is really working, but then you don't program every day in assembler. You understand the concepts and then you move on to something which is uh, more uh, efficient to write. So that will be our approach too. We understand the mechanism, we understand that it's complex. So I wanted to expose this to you to this be just because there are so many complexity, uh, so in details, and uh, and then we move on, and so we appreciate uh, how, how simple it is to work on a higher level framework. We will do the same with JavaScript. We start in creating web application directly in JavaScript. We'll see how many problems we have, and then we'll reach to React. Uh, where many of these problems uh, will be automatically solved by the framework. But at the same time, we'll still keep understanding what is happening under the hood. Do we use Bootstrap in our project or in the exam? You can use whatever you want, including Bootstrap, of course. Uh, usually in this course, we are trying, to, we will, uh, we, we decided one JavaScript framework, which is React, and one uh, CSS framework, which is Bootstrap, uh, because they are the two most popular ones. They are the, the ones that are used most in the world. Um, but uh, for React, of course, we'll stick to that in the exam. For the CSS, if you become familiar, or if you like another framework better than Bootstrap, you can switch, of course. It's up to you. For example, a lot of people are using, uh, in the book that we mentioned, the uh, full stack React book uh, that uh, we mentioned uh, in, the, in the material for the course. So we, are, we, also we, are, we will be taking some, uh, some material for the, for the lectures on React. They are using another framework, which is called Semantic UI. Uh, there are also recent uh, libraries, uh, maybe from, there's a one that I remember from Microsoft, which is about uh, the Fluent Design uh, CSS uh, library, or some library about Google about material design. So there are different CSS libraries that we can use, uh, and uh, they will all compatible with React. So we just learn one instead of 25 of them in the course. We learn Bootstrap, but you are free to do that. Uh, the, no, the, the, this question doesn't have any answer. Are there any CSS libraries better than Bootstrap? Uh, it depends, okay? It depends uh, on uh, what you mean by better, what you mean by, uh, and this depends on the type of project, uh, depends on the, how familiar you, have, uh, you are with the library with compared to another. So it's, uh, if you try <laughs> to ask this question on Stack Overflow, they will kill you. Say, okay, this is not a proper question. It's just a preference. And uh, you need to check uh, some of them and evaluate them. So uh, we know that Bootstrap is one of the most popular. It's used in many, many cases. Uh, and uh, it's, it's enough for us, okay? The best uh, or the better doesn't exist uh, in this context. You know the the proverb like that the better is the enemy of good. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, so if there are no other questions at the moment, I won't keep you connected 
just for staring at the blank screen. Um, and so we might uh, close the session. Uh, just, I have just a question for you. Uh, did you hear and see me and the whiteboard uh, uh, correctly? Were there any problems with the audio and the video? Because my network connection is not uh, the best ones in the world. So I just want to check. OK. Sometimes okay. it's a little bit lagging, but it's good overall. What? The video? Uh, no, uh, the audio. The audio? Sometimes okay. it's lagging, but overall it's good. OK, OK. Maybe next time I will try with the with the mobile hotspot. Uh, the 4G is working better than the DSL in the countryside here. OK. So if you have any further question, uh, you're free to contact us in, uh, on, on Slack. And also, if you have any suggestion about the organization of the course and whatever we, we discussed at the beginning. And for the rest, uh, thank you for being here today. And we'll meet uh, next week. Bye-bye to everybody. <laughs>